Hello and welcome to this short introduction to Digital Signal Processing, DSP for short. On the board you see an analog signal, which is what we have in normal everyday life. This is an analog world that we live in. What we want to do in Digital Signal Processing is to take that analog signal and turn it into a list of numbers which we can store in a computer memory or on a hard disk or a USB flash stick. So we see that there are two, two quantities there in the display, voltage and time. Both voltage and time are continuous with theoretically infinite precision. But in reality, the very real limitations of the actual electronic components, this is analog components, spoil this beautiful idea of infinite precision, and there is no such animal. The quest for analog purity, however, leads to bulky and very expensive equipment. You may ask why the world fought with analog for so many years and why we didn't just go digital years ago. Well, there were certain inherent problems with going digital, even though the concepts and ideas were well established before the capability to execute them became an absolute reality. For one thing, in the early days of uh, digital electronics, computer memory was very, very expensive. So files had to be very small. And uh, the list of numbers, therefore, could be very limited. In addition to that, the processing time or the speed of the actual hardware was quite slow. So we weren't able to keep up with the analog changes in real time. But as the memory prices came down and the speed increased, we eventually reached a point where digital became a viable replacement for analog. Now, how do we convert an analog signal to digital? The method that we do this by is going to have a big impact on all of our future discussions. So it's important that you understand the basics of what we are attempting to do. As you can see, we have our original analog signal and a number of lines with little circles on top of them at each of the integer values of time. What we are trying to show you here in this diagram is that we sample the amplitude or voltage of the signal at those specific time intervals and that becomes the numbers that we store. So clearly the sample rate, how often we take a reading of this analog voltage is going to have a bearing on how accurately it represents the analog signal. The more samples that we take or the higher the sample rate, the more numbers we're going to have to store. So we need more memory but the more accurately we will be able to record the information that takes place between the sample points shown in this simple diagram. Now what about resolution? Well, the sample resolution is the accuracy with which we can represent the voltage at any given point. Basically, it's just a measure of how accurate our reading is. And that's going to be determined by the number of bits that we're using 
in our system. So we see that the sample rate actually refers to our time axis and the sample resolution actually refers to our vertical axis or amplitude axis. The rate, more than anything, is determined by the speed of the system and our ability to hold all of these numbers generated by our ADC process, the size of the memory we are using. Okay. Now, let us look at that little time between two samples, which I've marked on the diagram TS. The time period between samples. This is the time that it actually takes to convert our voltage to a number and get that number stored in memory. If we can do that quicker, then we can move the sample points closer to each other. If it takes longer, then we have a problem. But whether, they're, whether they are close together or far apart, the, the, the same thing applies. It actually takes a small amount of time to convert the voltage to a number and to get that number stored in memory. We cannot have the voltage changing during this time interval because that's when we're trying to actually convert it. So how can we measure something that's changing? So we have to hold it steady for a short while so that we can do the conversion and we require a hold circuit to actually freeze the voltage at that point in time until we can measure it and store it. So that's what the sample and hold signal shown in the diagram refers to. You will see those little dashed lines are where we are holding that voltage constant until the next sample is taken, which produces that sort of stair step pattern that you're seeing there on the actual signal. Now the sampling frequency, or the frequency at which we're taking the samples, just like any other frequency, is going to be the reciprocal of the period. So that time period, TS, the time to take a sample, the reciprocal of that will be the sample frequency, FS. And this is the only thing that relates our list of numbers to the original analog signal that it represented. Now this will become increasingly important as we manipulate the list of numbers that we have. But if we were simply storing it and returning it to its original state without any digital signal processing, we would of necessity have to use the same sample rate for the operation of conversion as for the operation of turning the numbers back into discrete voltages. So it's important to realize that the sampling frequency has to be the same if we want to simply restore what we recorded before. Finally, because a digital signal is just a list of numbers, it is both discrete and finite. The list has a beginning and it has an end. And in addition to that, there is no in-between. That's the meaning of the word discrete versus continuous. So it would be wrong to think that we have anything going on between the two lines, say eight and nine, of two different samples. This is why our digital signal is simply shown as a number of lines, which we do not connect, and we simply put a dot or circle at the top to indicate the actual value of the number at that point in time. 
Now, all the perceived complexity of digital signal processing is nothing more than altering these numbers in various ways. Basically, we merely process our list of numbers using some kind of mathematical algorithm to turn them into another set of numbers, and that is all we do. Now, please remember all of this when you're fighting with your lab, tests, or exam. Because if you understand what you're dealing with, it will all be so very easy. There are two numbers indicated in the diagram with a simple time space or period of time between the two of them. Seems simple, doesn't it? Thanks for watching. See you in the next video.